Welcome, Welcome to, to Shenanigans Ensue with Mary San Giovanni! Folks, welcome to Cosmic Shenanigans. I'm Mary San Giovanni, and as always, I'm up to shenanigans of cosmic proportions. This week, I'm pretty excited to be talking about Robert E. Howard's The Tower of the Elephant. Uh, I like this because it's a little different than other cosmic horror stories, and we're going to get into why that is. This story first appeared in Weird Tales in March of 1933. It has been republished multiple times in assorted Conan collections and collections of Robert E. Howard's work. And although it's an early tale, early in the sense that it's one of the first Conan collections, he, uh, one of the first Conan stories, and he's pretty young in the story, it's considered by scholars to be a classic tale and one of the best of the Conan stories. Now, before I launch into this, I do want to note something. I know that uh, Robert E. Howard falls under criticism sometimes because of his attitude towards race and women. Now, I can't speak to the uh, racial aspect because I haven't read up enough about that yet. But regarding his, his view of women, I think that, you know, I like to give credit where credit is due. And I read an article in researching the show this week that uh, a... a I guess a, a, a friend, through a friend, a detractor tried to goad Howard into uh, ranting about women. And the letter he got back in response was one of the most eloquent and passionate arguments for women that I've ever read. Uh, he talks about these great women throughout history, these women who uh, whose accomplishments were just as good, if not better, than several male counterparts at the time. He talks about the great philosophers and thinkers throughout history that were women, um, the great inventors, the great writers. He, he speaks to their intellect, and uh, that at a time where women were believed to have less moral constrictions, that women were far more likely to cheat or other things. like He said that they're no more likely to cheat, that uh, in many ways they're, they're the equals of men. Of course, Howard, from, from my understanding, had a habit of passionately uh, expressing his views and his beliefs and then backtracking if he thought he was being judged. And he does at the end of this letter kind of talk about, well, you know, but why are we bothering to talk about their philosophical and intellectual contributions? As long as they're, you know, they have a nice face and a nice body, what more are men are really looking for? However, I, I suspect that that was tacked on the way that Howard often tacked on what he thought people wanted him to say, as opposed to what he actually believed, which was paragraphs of support of women. The reason I bring this up is because I think that it finds its way into his text, uh, whereas Lovecraft tended to completely disregard women as being sort of non-entities, or, or at the very least no more than uh, vessels for the birth of these monstrous gods. Howard gives a lot of autonomy and a lot of agency to women. Uh, there are, granted, a lot of, you know, nubile young dancers and, and, and women who are really sought to be no more than prizes. But if you think about the world he's created, that's... There are a lot of parallels in reading this story to something like Game of Thrones, where, yes, here's a society that goes to great lengths to put women at a disadvantage and to make them property, and yet these strong, powerful... Uh, intelligent women emerge anyway. And in this particular story, in The Tower of the Elephant, it starts off with a Kothian kidnapper in a tavern talking about the best ways to kidnap women. And ultimately, uh, the man is made to look like a fool. So both on a superficial and kind of a deeper level, 
I feel that Howard's saying that this is not this is not a guy to emulate. This is not something that we're supposed to say. Yeah, that's right. Women should be kidnapped because they're property. Uh, Conan essentially kills this guy, and he kills him for other reasons, not because he's talking about how to kidnap women. But the point is, they're all the same. Okay, that this there's uh, more to Conan, especially in this story. There's a lot more to Conan than I think. Uh, the movies or even sort of the public perception of Conan uh, really lays claim to. And I, and I had asked Brian Keene, who had been sitting next to me while I was, who is far more of a, a, an expert on Robert E. Howard's work and somebody that, um, uh, somebody that I, I tend to, you know, ask questions when it comes down to Conan. And I said, you know, he seems to be a lot more well-rounded here. And Brian, Brian, tell them what your response was about. Well, hello, I I was in the other room working, and and I I, I heard my name mentioned. We're discussing Conan. We're discussing Conan, and and I had said that in this particular story, and maybe this is one of the reasons why it's considered one of his best. Conan is a far more complex character, I think, than people give him credit for. He feels bad for people. He, he feels, feels pity. scared. He he feels pity. He does. Um, and he feels genuine empathy. And why do you think that over time that that was sort of uh, muted or dampened down somewhat? You have to look at the the time frame. Um, you know, Howard often wrote the Conan stories out of order. You'd have a story where Conan was in his 40s and a, a king. Right. Uh, and it would be followed up by a story of Conan in his teenage years escaping slavers and falling in love with the Frost Giant's daughter. Um but when Tower of the Elephant takes place, Conan is very new to civilization. He's not that far from escaping the slavers. Right. Um, so this is all new to him. Um, but already he is learning that he doesn't have patience for assholes. This is true. Uh, and, he, yeah, he, he's, he, he hasn't been exposed to civilization enough to, to just burn him out. And that At this does, point in Tower of the Elephant. That does come up several times in relation to the cosmic horror element of this particular story, uh, which we're going to get to. But I think that, uh, you know, Brian had told me, and you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but Brian had told me several times that these stories are not as sexist and misogynistic as the general public believes they They're are. They're not. And, and uh, do you think that's a fair assessment to say that even in the subtleties of it, um, he's still is writing about strong women as equal partners, but in a society that treats them like property. They, exactly. Uh, the, the equivalent would be today's Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Okay, in the, in the Hyperborean age, everybody treats women that way. And yet, you know, Howard imbues many... You know, yes, there are characters who are there as a foil for Conan to save, sure. Right. Same in King Cole, same in Bram McMorrin, same in Solomon Cain, but... There are many female characters that, that Howard imbues with a sense of agency, something that th he probably wasn't even aware of back then. Right. Um, and I don't, I don't think he gets enough credit for that. I genuinely don't. Um, and you saw that carried over even in uh, the, the 70s Marvel Comics adaptations. I was going to uh, ask know, about that. Is that such true? Such as Bullet. The okay. You know, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, Howard had no problem writing strong, capable women who could think their own way out of the situation, who could fight their own way out of the situation, um, who could use cunning to get out of a situation. Uh, and I don't think he gets enough credit for that. And, and many of those women do appear in the, in the Conan stories. I, you know, I, I, I'm, glad that, I'm glad that you brought up the, the comic book aspect of it, because I was, I was wondering if that carried... I think that's such a... a I, I like the stories even when I thought they were sexist and misogynistic. I'm not going to lie. There's something um, that just appeals to well, me about the stories. You, you, also, written. you also have to keep in mind the time that these were written. Right. They're written in 1933 was the, this particular story. And who he was writing them for. I mean, He's these, these were men. going to the men's magazines, you know, right. the, the pulp magazines. Uh, so, you know, if, if to use the Frost, Giant, Frost Giant's daughter, for example, in, in describing her... Yes, he is going to write her in a way that will appeal to the male gaze, okay? Right. But then go on to read what he does with the character. You know, right. uh, she, she's a person. She's a fully fleshed being. And to be honest, having read some of the descriptions that he uses of men, they're no less uh, 
meatified or beefcakeified or he wrote for the fight. female gaze as well. Yeah, I mean Conan sounds pretty hot. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Um, as do a lot of the women in, in these in these particular stories. And, but anyway, my point in 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 bringing Brian into this is that I I feel that Brian should be vindicated. And having said that, there's a lot more to these stories, I think, and to the dynamic of the character who I kind of thought was sort of a mindless barbarian. He's not. And, and to the, the uh, depiction of women, despite, you know, uh, to me, to me, the, the women who are slaves or prizes, that's no different than the women who are, who are basically bought and sold throughout Game of Thrones and throughout a lot of ancient Greek kind of stories. There is a, uh, what I find impressive in both say Game of Thrones and this particular story is that, these women find a way around it anyway. They find a way to to use the powers they do have. Exactly. To uh, to exist and survive in this world. The same as men use, you know, physical strength and, and brutality. And women, as Brian said, use a whole host of other things in order to survive alongside them, not beneath them. Right. So. This was actually, and then I'll let you get back to your show because this is your show. But uh, th- this was actually the first Conan story prose that I read. I, I was introduced to Conan when I was 10 years old. Okay. Uh, it was the Marvel Comics. It was issue 81. I still remember the issue number. I have. I still have the issue. Um, and about a year later, when I was 11, I found uh, Tower of the Elephant in a paperback. And uh, I'm not sure 11 is old enough to appreciate all of it, but, uh, it, but it, 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 it blew my mind. Uh, so the uh, without spoiling the the rest of this episode, the entity in this story that was cosmic horror to me. I I didn't discover Cthulhu until many many years later. So it's interesting that he takes that he continually blends, and I guess this would be um, I'm not sure what kind of subgenre of fantasy. Maybe like a, weird fantasy. Weird fan. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because he, he, he does take a lot of mythology and history from the real world and work it and rework it into a fantasy setting. Well, he does a lot of that. I mean, you know, you, you're talking about the, the women being bought and sold. Um, I mean, you know, the Hyborian Age, is it's, it's fiction. Right. Um, but there's a historical precedent for it. And, and these days, of course, people know Howard for Conan, mm-hmm. maybe Cole, maybe Red Sonja. Right. Uh, but... People forget he did a lot of historical fiction, not just westerns either. Uh, you know, Solomon Kane is, is historical, historical fiction. fiction, right? Uh, and, you know, uh, he did he did things about the Roman Empire. Um, lot, he was he loved history. He clearly and, he clearly knows ancient history. Yeah, and he, and he his his fiction and, and even some of the nonfiction he wrote is imbued with that. Uh, but yeah, the Tower of the Elephant. Formative on eleven year old Brian. I could see that, and and oh, another thing that I've noticed. I mean, we covered another Robert E. Howard story early on. We covered the Black Stone, which is, by all accounts, cosmic horror, uh, on this show. Um, but there's a kind of beauty to the prose, uh, almost a Clark Ashton Smith level uh, poetry to the prose in Conan stories that. I mean, I, not having read a lot of Robert E. Howard, uh, it, it doesn't. I, I don't know if it if it crosses over into other characters like Conan, but it's definitely there in his Conan. Well, there's a cadence, and uh, I, I don't believe it's apocryphal. I think I think it's factual. Howard often recited his stories out loud out as he loud. wrote them, right? Um, and you can you can pick up on that cadence. You can. Yeah. You can. You can. You can feel his excitement and his passion in writing these Conan stories, and. Up until this point, I haven't covered them because I didn't think that there was an overlap into true cosmic horror. I've, like I said, I covered a, the Black Stone, which is a cosmic horror story. Uh, and it's also important, I think, to note that Robert E. Howard and Lovecraft were friends. They were, uh, they'd never they were, met in they person. They were pen pals. Right? Never met in person, but they were, they were pen pals. But they were, you know, very, they admired each other's work. They were, uh, you know, fond of each other, so far as we can tell. And... It's interesting how Robert E. Howard's take on cosmic horror differs from Lovecraft's, uh, and and that's what we're going to get into. But thank you, thank you, absolutely, and thank you, Cosmic Shenanigans listeners. And uh, I will go now. Hither went Keenan. <laughs>
bald of head and broad of gut. <laughs> Still swinging that sword. <laughs> As he does. The first line in this short story, which to me is an indication of the cosmic horror to come, is essentially this is a story that Conan hears of a tower, okay, the Tower of the Elephant, where an incredibly priceless, valuable gem is. And as is Conan's way, he's going to break into this tower and steal this gem. It's it belongs to a, a sorcerer, a wizard. Now, it's important to note that in this world, magic is fairly commonplace, but not entirely trusted by barbarians like Conan. Uh, his people are not big into magic, so far as I can tell. Uh, but in other places, magic is, is fairly common. And this wizard is a horrible person. His, his name is Yara, and he's, he's a bad guy. And he's the one who owns this tower. So they're breaking into the... Conan is breaking into this uh, sort of fortress, really. These these walls around walls that are built around this tower. And there are gardens in between the walls. And he comes across uh, a Nemedian who's essentially known as the Prince of Thieves. His name is Taurus. Okay, and when Conan remarks that the lions who are guarding this garden don't act like normal lions. They don't roar and charge. They sneak up on people. Uh, they don't behave as lions normally would. Taurus says, all things are strange in this garden. And that that's our first... It, it, it seems almost like a small throwaway line, but that's our first indication that things are weird here. Because what this line indicates is that things in this place... Animals, plants, people, they don't work even as they would in a fantasy world. Howard took great pains, so far as, I, as, so far as I've read, to build his own world with a set of rules and logic. There is a norm in this world. There is a, a, you know, the, the base level of normal, and that base level of normal includes magic. And an understanding of worlds, you know, beyond ours and an afterlife and gods and, and monsters. And yet, there is something about this place that does not jive with even this world's norm. And that's sort of an important thing. In Cosmic Horror, we know that uh, the introduction of elements which contradict or challenge our sense of reality is an important thing. Now, Conan does manage to kick butt all the way up this tower and back down again. And when he reaches the elephant in question, okay, uh, we this is this is the passage that describes this. As Conan came forward, his eyes fixed on the motionless idol, the eyes of the thing opened suddenly. The Sumerian froze in his tracks. It was no image, it was a living thing, and he was trapped in its chamber. That he did not instantly explode in a burst of murderous frenzy is a fact that measures his horror, which paralyzed him where he stood. A civilized man in his position would have sought doubtful refuge in the conclusion that he was insane. It did not occur to the Sumerian to doubt his senses. He knew he was face to face with a demon of the elder world, and the realization robbed him of all his faculties except sight. Now, what I like about this particular uh, passage, other than our, you know, uh, the if, if we're playing the, the drinking bingo of, of cosmic horror, a mention of an elder world, uh, is his approach to sanity and insanity. Uh, I... I suspect, and, and again, I could be wrong because I have, I have yet to read enough of Howard to really fully, you know, speak with confidence to this, but I believe it could be a retort to what he might have perceived, despite their friendship, uh, as Lovecraft's sort of fainting, screaming, driven to madness, somewhat effeminate men who are not possessed of the physical or sexual prowess of the kind of guy like Conan is, uh, or Howard's other uncivilized, and I put that in quote, his uncivilized characters. Uh, Frequently throughout the story, 
Howard mentions that Conan is not a civilized man. As Brian said, he's recently released from slavers, or recently escaped from slavers, and has has grown up in a world of uncivilized behavior, barbaric and violent behavior. And so a lot of the nuances of civilization and civility are sort of lost on him. I mean, and, and I think it's interesting that sanity and insanity is one of those things. It doesn't occur to Conan to think he's going crazy. He's basically going by what he sees. And I think that's kind of cool. It's almost like Howard saying, here, Lovecraft, hold my beer. Let me show you how a real man, you know, approaches cosmic car. Now, that's not to say that people who react the way Lovecraft's characters are any less manly. It's just that I suspect that given Howard's reputation and as a person, both as a person and as a writer of these kinds of men, that he might see, he might perceive somebody, you know, screaming into the darkness and going insane from having witnessed something or fainting, you know, dead away from seeing a monster would have been silly. You know, it would have been sort of nonsense. So we have a different kind of character and how he would handle the revelation of cosmic horror. Okay. The entity itself, uh, this is what the entity tells Conan. He says, there are many worlds besides this earth. See, already I'm sold because I like anything where there's many worlds besides this earth. There are many worlds beside this earth and life takes many shapes. I am neither God nor demon, but flesh and blood like yourself, though the substance differ in part and the form be cast in a different mold. I am very old, O man of the waste countries. Long and long ago I came to this planet with others of my world, from the green planet Yag, which circles forever in the outer fringe of this universe. We swept through space on mighty wings that drove us through the cosmos quicker than light, because we had warred with the kings of Yag and were defeated and outcast. But we could never return, for on earth our wings withered from our shoulders. Here we abode apart from earthly life. We fought the strange and terrible forms of life, which then walked the earth, so that we became feared and were not molested in the dim jungles of the east where we had our abode. Okay? So much of this is very much like the Lovecraftian entities uh, that the man himself describes in his stories, down to the idea that they fly through space over eons uh, on, on, on great wings, that they are made of a different kind of substance that uh, gives them the ability to, to live many lifetimes and to adapt to different places. And also that in having these kinds of powers, they arise to a godlike status. All right? This is, I mean, it, it, it's almost, in some ways, almost verbatim from something Lovecraft would write about Cthulhu or, you know, the, the, the elder gods or the old ones. I mean, it's, there's a lot of similarity here. So we have very much a cosmic horror entity. Now, what I think is interesting about this is that in a lot of cosmic horror, uh, a lot of traditional cosmic horror, and especially in a lot of Lovecraftian horror, what we get is this idea of something so alien to us that it is indifferent to us. And it's so powerful that it it essentially diminishes or dwarfs our significance in the universe. Now, at first, it's the strange alienness, the utterly unrelatable aspect, both physically and magically, of this creature, which ignites horror in Conan. Later though, and here's where I think this is an interesting twist, we're dealing with a different kind of person than a lot of Lovecraftian cosmic horror, a lot of cosmic horror in general. Um, this man is a very capable, very uh, straightforwardly thinking kind of guy. And later on, it becomes this tragic and pathetic plight in which the creature finds itself enslaved and tortured by the wizard Yara, that's what Conan finds horrific. 
And I think that's sort of an interesting... First of all, it's an interesting uh, comment on Conan's character because, uh, as, I, as I mentioned to, to Brian when I was reading this, I didn't think that Conan was ever inclined to be sympathetic to anyone. So it's a nice sort of uh, multifaceted aspect of his character that he has a code. He has a code of honor and of conduct. And even something that he finds appalling both because it is a magical entity and also because it is something so completely unlike any uh, human-type creature he's, he's ever encountered, the fact that this, this creature has been tortured and uh, mutilated and seriously, it, it, it's seriously traumatized by the 300 years of enslavement at the hands of, of Yara is is an interesting approach to the cosmic horror entity. We're not usually meant to feel sorry for the entity because the entity doesn't feel anything for us. However, in this story, the cosmic horror entity does have feelings. It it does have a a sense of home, a sense of memory, a sense of loss. And it, it's interesting that the horror focus is shifted on in a way, the kind of the kind of awfulness of even the gods falling, even the gods losing something. Um, when the entity finally does uh, have its revenge on Yara, uh, thanks to Conan's help, uh, Conan does what this being asks and uh, tears his heart out, basically, because, again, this is a cosmic entity, and as Conan comes to realize, uh, life can exist by different definitions, and for something like this creature, life is not limited to one kind of existence. So he does what the creature asks, and he squeezes the blood from this creature's heart onto this stone, the heart of the elephant, in order to uh, enact an enchantment which will finally defeat Yara. Now, the passage that I'm reading, I think, speaks to that. Immersed in a feeling of overpowering unreality, the Sumerian was no longer sure of his own identity. He only knew that he was looking upon the external evidence of the unseen play of vast outer forces beyond his understanding. Well, I mean, that is pretty much, in summary, a cosmic horror story, is that what the, the character, the main characters, is experiencing is external evidence of the unseen play of vast outer forces beyond his understanding. What this does, though, I think, is, is it, it, it doesn't drive him to madness, but it does affect him. It does affect his future. Uh, Brian told me that uh, Conan never trusts wizards in any of the stories. That uh, there's there's always a deep-seated hatred and mistrust of any kind of magic user. And I suspect it may be because of this experience at so young an age. Now, again, as I said, this is another example of cosmic horror, but it's in a different setting. It's a fantasy setting, which, as I mentioned, has different concepts of normal than our world to begin with. Uh, there is, you know, the foregone conclusion that magic exists. There is an acceptance and awareness of occult and arcane knowledge. These outer forces, these, these uh, other places that beings can come from. Now, with that in place, what we get then is a cosmic horror story where the cosmic horror here doesn't exist as a result of learning that which should not never have been learned in the first place, but in learning that even gods are fallible, that even gods are subject to uh, things worse than death. And we've talked in past episodes about how a lot of cosmic horror, uh, the, the focus is on what might be worse than dying, you know, what might be worse than that particular kind of loss. And it exists here in this story. Um, as my limited experience with Howard's work would seem to suggest, the world of Conan could easily be classified as violent and harsh, 
a world in which the individual doesn't matter, okay, which is another cosmic horror aspect anyway, that life has little value. Uh, one would think that nihilism would seem a common outgrowth of such a barbaric environment. Why bother? Because life, uh, you only hold on to life until you die. However, you know, and again, this is a world which we might imagine would give rise to the kinds of cults which worship ancient gods of power and place and purpose. Um, but this does, this whole world does seem to uh, fit into a more modern mold of cosmic horror in that uh, the idea of significance is redefined. Conan, who's young and essentially an unknown in this story, he doesn't have the kind of reputation where he walks in and says, well, I'm Conan, and people say, oh shit, here's Conan. Um, He's young, but he is slowly carving a name for himself and an identity, which is, I believe, the fantasy aspect of it. The fantasy is always about the journey. Uh, but his goals are not to raise the significance and importance of the human race, which, again, in, I think in anything, in any kind of modern cosmic horror, it's never about, despite the fact that you're saving mankind all the time, it's never about the benefit of mankind, really. It's about... Uh, survival and about what you need to be uh, okay. You know, what you need to make everything okay. And what Conan does is he reflects the ideals of many cosmic horror heroes and that he redefines his own significance. He redefines uh, success based on what is important to him. Uh, his reason to be. And his reason to be is often revenge or wealth, or power. Uh, sometimes his reason to be is just to stay alive because he's got that kind of iron will that says, I'm not going to let you get one up on me, you know? Um, and I think that that's, you know, there are, despite the setting, which is different, there are so many things that, that make this a cosmic horror story in all the right ways, in all the traditional ways, and in all the ways that cosmic horror is now uh, evolving into. And so I think this is sort of a fascinating uh, entry into this, this canon of cosmic horror that we're looking at because uh, it is not, despite the fact that it was written uh, somewhat parallel to Lovecraft's work, uh, it's a little bit later than a lot of his major, his major works, um, but there is still that, uh, the beginning of the evolution of cosmic horror that even in that despite settings, which normally I think, I shouldn't say despite settings, what really what it is is that cosmic horror is so very much about the setting as almost a character that it's interesting to see something that is taken out of, you know, 1920s New England and set in a completely different way and yet still captures all of the essential aspects of a cosmic horror story and does it in a very eloquent and admittedly surprisingly beautiful way. So that is the Tower of the Elephant, my first foray, foray into an actual reading an actual Conan story and I very much enjoyed it. Uh, if you enjoyed Cosmic Shenanigans, you might also enjoy another show that I co-host, which is The Horror Show with Brian Keene. Uh, both of these shows, my show and The Horror Show with Brian Keene, are available on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, I think iHeartRadio, if it's still out there, and all other platforms via the Project Entertainment Network. Uh, I also, as always, want to thank uh, engineer Dave Thomas. You can watch his channel most nights at twitch.tv slash Meteor Notes. And again, another thank you to Brian Keene for uh, giving us his input and the historical uh, insight into Howard's work and the themes of, of Conan and, and, and basically just being a good giggle all the time. So thank you both to, to both of those gentlemen. Thank you to the listening audience for listening to this show again, and I will see you next week.
Bye. How do people who make stuff up for a living make stuff up? New York Times bestseller Jonathan Mayberry told us. Oprah's book club favorite Sue Miller told us. You know, you sort of take a character and make some bad things happen. How do we get them to do that? We colored them, just like at a cocktail party, except through your headphones. Join us every Thursday for the Liars Club Oddcast. A slightly unhinged podcast where storytellers interview other storytellers. Available on Project Entertainment Network, iTunes, and everywhere podcasts are heard.